Hello everyone, my name is Andrew, today we're getting learning Python and today we'll talk about repository pattern in Python. So let's start. Imagine that we have views.py file and there is a function called get user by id inside or get user by id view inside. So that function is used in order to process our requests from the users and um, return the user that has some id that our clients provided. So very simple function. And um, if we're talking about users, if we're talking about real world applications, then we probably have some data storage. And um, in most of the cases, that data storage is a database of some sort. And uh, let's imagine that our database is an SQL database. So what we can do in um, order to return our user by his ID is use return, some sort of connection that is in our database and then connection.query, query from select all from users where id equals to some sort of request.id. So that is the most simple way of getting our user from an SQL database. Why is that? Because basically what we are doing is we're saying that we have some sort of connection to our database and we need to query everything from our users table where id is the id that was provided in our request. That is the simplest way. But of course there are tons of problems with that. First of all, we write raw SQL queries or raw MongoDB queries, raw no SQL queries, any sort of queries in our views. And why is it bad? First of all, it's bad because in terms of SQL and um, other queries, we can use injection attacks in order to do some harm to our program. So what if request user ID is not an integer, is not an UUID of our user? What if it's a malicious string that uh, will allow us to drop our database, to select all the users, to do some harm to our database. So that is the first thing that we need to consider, that those queries are very, very, very. Yeah, we can execute many SQL in injections on those queries if we write them ourselves. So that is the first problem. The second problem is that uh, our queries are just written inside of our views. And imagine that if we need to change our database or if we need to change the way our database works, so we had uh, one user table and we need to add uh, user groups to our data schema. And if we do that, maybe we'll need to change some of our queries. That is not the way to go. Aside from that, if we change the database from SQL to NovoSQL, then we'll probably need to change the queries themselves, so the syntax of queries. And uh, because of that, we don't write raw SQL queries inside of our views. What we can use in that case is an ORM. So ORM is... Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know, object duration mapping is a way of representing our tables in terms of SQL, representing our documents in, term, in terms of um, document-oriented NoSQL databases as objects in the programming language that we're using. So instead of writing our SQL query like that, we're going to write user.objects.get and id equals request.id. That is much better because we remove all of the syntax out so syntaxes of our queries out of the way. Right now we only see that we query user objects and we want to get the user which ID is request.id that our user provided. So that is much better. However, in terms of architecture, we still have some problems. So the first problem which comes with an ORM is that ORMs are slow. So all of that uh, query generation, all of that query construction is relatively slow. It's not going to impact your application if you it's not going to impact your application if your ORM is good enough and you write good optimization for those queries, but still it's going to be much slower than just raw SQL queries. However, in terms of architecture, what does ORM give to us? If I'm going to change from MySQL to SQL Server, for example, so two different databases, I will probably do not need to change any of the ORM queries that I'm writing because my ORM will change them as I change my database in my settings, in my uh, configuration or somewhere else. So that is a big, big plus. With SQL queries, when we change from MySQL to PostgreSQL, for example, we need to change the syntax and the things in our queries because some construction or some uh, clauses can be supported in PostgreSQL but do not support, are not supported in MySQL. So some sort of problems like that. But with, with ORM, we can remove all of those things, all of those complications, and just um, write our 
SQL queries like that. So not SQL queries, but write, write our data, write our work with data like that. So we will work with our data, with our database using our ORM, using our objects and uh, the query system that that ORM provides. However, in terms of architecture, there is still a problem. The problem is that if we need to change the way our data is stored, so for example, we need to change the database from an SQL database to a NoSQL database. And as many of you know, some NoSQL databases do not provide structured query language, so they do not provide SQL. So for example, there are some uh, versions of products like Cassandra that have built in somewhat SQL and uh, other versions like MongoDB that do not have any type of SQL in them. And there is a problem that if we're going to change our database or if we're going to change the logic of our queries, the data schema that we're using, we're going to need to change all the queries. So that is the problem. Because of that, what we are typically doing is instead of calling our user objects get inside of our view, we're going to create another function, another function called something like get user by ID. It's gonna accept ID and we can even provide typings here and it's gonna return our user objects get from our ID. So as you can see, I created a new file. Well, you can imagine that you create a new file which is called something like services.py. You can create different modules and all that stuff. But that file simply contains the function that you are using. So for example, get user by ID. And what's the best thing is that if I'm going to use services functions, so if I'm going to split my business logic from the views from the outer world, so from the things that are related to the outer world, not to our application and the logic within our application, what I'm able to do is change like the real logic, the real data schema only inside of those services.py. So if I need to change my uh, for example, SQL database to no SQL database, I'm only going to do that inside of the files that represent my business logic. If my logic changes, for example, the way I query users, the way I save users, update them, only the services.py files, typically it's not one file, but a collection of those are going to change. And uh, yeah, that's just very great in terms of architecture. However, there is still one big problem. That problem is that if we are using services, and we still query the objects using an ORM, using raw SQL queries, raw non-SQL queries, there is still one big problem. What if we need to change the way our data is stored? What if we need to change the way our queries work all at once? What I'm gonna do in that case? So typically business logic is not just like query user and return it. Typically business logic is something like query user, or let's imagine that we save our user get the data from the views.py, then go to services.py, call a function, check that uh, user password is uh, good enough, check that username is unique, and only after that, save the user. So we're gonna have like the real logic and the way that we store and uh, manipulate our data in one, in one uh, pile of code, because yeah, we use services.py for both the logic, so the raw logic of our application, and for the way that we relate our objects that we connect to our database, that we use our data. So that is very, very bad. And that's where repository pattern comes in handy. So what is that? Repository pattern, let me create a new imaginary file, repositories. Typically we create different repositories for different um, aggregates. So for different groups of objects, like for users, for um, let's imagine products, for orders and all that stuff. What I'm going to do here is create a class called user repository. Typically, it's a class. You will see why. And user repository, what it will basically do, it will separate the data storage, the data manipulation from our logic. Once again, why do we need that? Because if we ever need to change the way we store data, the way we manipulate with, we manipulate our data, what we're going to have to do is change the services with UI but those are only responsible for the logic of our application. They do not care where we store our information. And that is why we have repository. So what repository can have? It can have different functions like define save. Your save can have user inside and the only thing that it will do is user.save. Your um, repository can have function get by ID. 
we're gonna accept ID here and we're gonna return the object that has that ID. Yeah, that has that ID that we provided here. And uh, basically you can write any functions that you wish in here. But there is one big addition that I want to tell you about. You only need to write the functions that do not represent any logic in your application because all the logic goes inside of the services. User repository is only capable of getting your data and is only capable of uh, managing your data. So you only manage, save, update, delete, do whatever you want with your data, but there is no logic inside of your user repository. Maybe a little bit of logic, it depends on your function. So for example, if you want to have something like filter by quarks, so filter by queued arguments, then you can add some logic. So for example, you can create quarks from a dictionary or something. So the logic that is only related to the way we store and manipulate our data. That is the only logic you can have in user repository because once again, that uh, layer is only used in order to separate the way we store our data and the way we manipulate it. That's the only thing that it's used for. All of the raw logic of replication goes in services and all of the interactions with the outer world go in views, routes, or whatever you like. That's how it works. And uh, why is user repository beneficial for us? If I'm gonna change the way my data is stored, I'm only gonna change repositories.py. I do not touch any of the services.py and that is much better because now if I change my database from one to another, what I can do is just change the you change the repositories and do not touch my logic because the logic did not change. Only the way we store our data and uh, work with it did change. And that's why I only need to use repository if I want to ever change the way that we store our data. Another big addition is that in some applications, we don't only have a database, but some kind of a data storage other than that. For example, we have um, something like a set of files on our local machine. So imagine that we save some things in files on our local machine. What, I can, what I'm gonna do is create an image repository. So imagine that we save images. Image repository, and it's still gonna have a save function. And uh, by the way, it's, it's a very good practice to have something like an abstract repository, which has all the functions that you probably need in all of your repositories, like save, delete, update, get by ID, filter, and so on. And then other repositories inherit from that, and if they need, they add their own functions. And once again, without the logic that is uh, inside of our application, only the logic that is related to the database manipulation. All right, and image repository will have something like safe in here, and we're not gonna use an ORM or any like SQL system, no SQL. We're gonna use simple with open file.txt as file, file.write image, src. SRC, something like that. So as you can see, we're not only we're not only able to work with the database because image repository is about any data storage, not image repository, but repository pattern in general. It's not about any database. It's not about a very particular set of set of products. It's about any way you can persist your data on any with any technology you like. So however you want, and that is the best thing about that pattern. So once again, it's only used in order to separate the way you manipulate and handle your data from your raw logic in your application and um, never create only one repository because if you have just like a repository, you only can have it an, as an abstract class that other classes inherit from and uh, yeah, override their own functions. Well, not all right, but replace in our case because we're talking about Python. What's better if you create a repository for every aggregate? And uh, yeah, you can read about aggregates, what are those and how do they work, but simply create a repository for different tables, for different objects that are related to each other. So thank you for the watching. That was relatively simple. If you have any questions, you can ask them down in the comments. My name is Andrew. Thank you for the watching and bye bye.